We want to look at the first 14 verses of John chapter 21. And the title I've given this section is In Broad Daylight. In Broad Daylight. Many of the rest of the appearances of the Lord were at night or in a closed room and some might have thought that this was therefore some kind of an apparition or, a, or, or perhaps a, a dream. But here we have a, a vision, no, a description of the Lord of Glory speaking with his disciples in broad daylight. Jesus is alive, he has risen from the grave. And you and I need to be reminded of this continually for our own good. There's a man called Josh McDowell, you may have read some of his books, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, or Evidence That Demands a Verdict too. Apparently when he was in university, he was a thoroughgoing sceptic and hated religion until some students invited him to examine the claims and the evidence for Christianity. And after he accepted the challenge, he became a believer. And the reason he gives in the book, he could not refute the evidence for the resurrection. The resurrection, dear friends, is the key to the holy boldness that should be ours, the joy that should be ours. And you and I need to look at these in detail that we might be equipped and encouraged by them. We need to recommit ourselves every time we read it to the work of the gospel. I've got three subheadings for you. Back home, before Jesus, and breakfast time. Back home, before Jesus, and breakfast time. The first four verses tell us that the disciples are back in their home region. And that in their home region, they return to their old occupation. They're back where the journey had begun. They've actually been instructed by Jesus through the women to make their way to Galilee because they will indeed see the risen Lord. But go tell his disciples, Mark 16 verse 7, and Peter, that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. So they're back home and there's a sense in which they're being obedient, but needs must and press upon them. They need food for their bellies. They may well need um, supplies for their families. They may even be wondering what's going to happen now that we're back in Galilee and Jesus is going to appear to us. Well, some people say there's nothing more relaxing than to go fishing. But I don't think their kind of fishing was that kind of fishing, was it? Anyway, that's exactly where we find them. Working in their own power, by their own strength, and as the testimony of the scriptures are quite clear, failing to catch anything. It says here, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. It also says that later on that this was the third time in verse 14. This is the third time he appears to a group of disciples. If you follow through the appearances of Christ, there are seven recorded appearances of Christ to individuals and to the disciples. But here we have a group, not the whole group because there's only seven of them, but a, a large part of the group of the disciples. They're beside the Sea of Tiberias. That sea is, in fact, the Sea of Galilee. John chapter 6 and verse 1. <coughs> After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Their home. They're back where Jesus was brought up. They're back where most of his ministry had taken place. Their home. It was called the Sea of Tiberias because the Romans built a city there to the honour of Tiberias. And it was a spa city, so the Romans used it extensively. So the lake had both names. And here we find them going about their business, waiting to see what's going to happen, wondering what's going to happen. Listen to Simon Peter. Um, he's with Thomas the twin, and that's important from chapter 20. He's the one 
who wouldn't believe unless he saw. He now believes Christ is alive, but here he is back with the group. Simon Peter, verse 3, I am going fishing. We are going with you also. And they went out immediately. Now, at least three of them were professional fishermen. And some years before, on this very Sea of Galilee, when they had likewise been fishing and been unable to make any catch, the Lord of Glory had stood on the shore and spoken to them. You remember that miracle, Luke chapter 5 is the full account of it. And as you go into this passage, you have to see continually that what's happening is the, the, the call of the disciples and their commission, which was given in various events earlier on in the Gospels, are being re-given to them. Now that the resurrection has happened. They've gone back to their old ways. The Lord of glory will show them that they, they need to carry on. Believing that they were not simply to be fishers of fish. But were to become fishers of men. But fishing for men like fishing for fish in this kind of a circumstance. is not something that can just be accomplished by human strength. By human wisdom. By human effort. They need the Lord Jesus to be involved in this whole business. Night time was the favourite time to go fishing apparently. Because... In the morning then you could take the fish directly to market as fresh fish. So they go out during the night. Everything that's here just fills in the detail and takes you back. Back to Luke chapter 5. Where we're reminded that the Lord had in fact called them away from this. Called them to trust him. Called them to follow him and to be his men in his world to fish for men. There is no doubt a... Uh, a tendency here. We don't want to be too critical for them of them. They needed food, they needed income, they need to work for that. But there's definitely in the way it's written a, a sort of suggestion that they're they're not firing their all cylinders. They're not full on for the Lord Jesus Christ. What's happening is they're caught in a bit of a, a conundrum. And as it says in verse four, but when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know him. Jesus stood on the shore. I hadn't realized the significance of Jesus standing in their midst until I was reading on Friday, I think it was, and it, it was pointed out to me, of course, you see, standing is the very opposite of what a corpse does. A corpse lies, doesn't it? Jesus stands, and in standing it is a declaration that he's been brought back from the dead. And there he is standing on the shore. And for some reason, they can't recognize him. We're told that the, the smaller boat was 200 cubits away from the shore. That's a, a hundred yards, hundred meters or thereabouts. <coughs> and there might have been a morning mist. You can find all sorts of reasons for them not immediately recognize him. And another one, it might be that they didn't expect him to be there. I had that last week. We had a new back door fitted. And there were two men came and I left them to get on with it. It wasn't until they, they were almost finished and Kath was back home. She says, do you realize one of them is Lisa's dad? I says, no. I didn't expect him to be there fitting back doors. He lives six or seven doors down the road from me. And as far as I knew, he worked on a fish farm. But now he's fitting back doors. You see, when, when you don't expect people in a context... There's something, at least in my mind, which shuts off the realisation it might be there. I did speak to him and apologise for not recognising him. Uh, I've known him for years. And so it is, the disciples, uh, you can pile up reasons why they might not recognise him. There might even have been a supernatural restraint put on their eyes as there was in Luke 24. But here he is on the shore, waiting to greet the disciples and to, to bring them back from this sort of sidestep that they've taken and to recommission them into the work of the gospel. So they're back home, but they're not back home to settle. The Lord will sort that out. I just thought at this point that you need to think about the application, don't you? There's, there's a tendency when we get back home to let things go. 
we lock the door and then who knows what happens behind your closed doors I've known most of you long enough not to have any suspicions but who knows what happens behind your locked doors and what we read in the newspapers tell us that sometimes real wickedness is taking place behind people's locked doors because when you go home there's a, there's a sort of switching off isn't there kick the shoes off, get the feet up and you become careless and this passage then first of all comes to challenge that kind of thinking as a Christian, you're a Christian 24-7 as they say nowadays and even in your relaxation you should still be a Christian you should still be a servant of Jesus Christ you should still be saying if he was in the room would I be embarrassed and dear friends that's something that needs to come to us from those passages because we carry enough of our old man with us our old woman to drag us down to what we once were and the challenge of the passage really comes to us in that sense the disciples had been told to meet him in Galilee they were, they were called to go to a mountain but where did they go says John Curson they went to the beach and that has to stimulate us to recognize our own tendency to just let the old ways rush back into our life when in actual fact we need to know that we are called to follow Jesus you see at the heart of being a Christian because we have a new heart because God's law has been written on our hearts there is to be this willingness to obey him and be where he wants us to be but we're not perfect yet and therefore there will be a continual challenge it always intrigues me in the Lord's Prayer we're to pray Lord lead us not into temptation don't take us to that place it's almost a confession because if I get there then what will happen is I will tragically find myself in disobedience the real mark of being a believer is that you be and act as Christ has called you to be and act that's how you became a Christian you were commanded to believe and you believed that's how you went on as a Christian you were commanded to be baptized and you were baptized and now quite frankly the rest of our behavior is to be such as honors him because we're in a relationship with God it's not just a theory in a book he's not just a name in a story he's alive he is, in fact, present in this room right now. Are you and I conscious of his presence? Are we recognizing him? Are we training ourselves to see him everywhere? In him you live and move and have your being. Sort of sums it up well, doesn't it, from Acts 17. He says, if I go, I will send another helper. And in the person of the Holy Spirit, Christ is continually present, not just in the room, but in ourselves. And thereby, I want to challenge you, as I've challenged myself, about continually being conscious of Christ with me. And that's something we need to communicate to the unbeliever. This Christianity is not just my hobby, it's not just my club, <coughs> it's not just what interests me. It is, in fact, who I am. I'm in a living relationship with Christ. That's what the world's looking for in drug, drink, alcohol, fun, pleasure, holidays, happiness. That's what they're after all the time and they're, 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 they're disappointed <coughs> if they can't find it. We have, in fact, found in Christ a peace that passes all understanding. And that's what we have to recommend to the unbeliever. And for that reason, we need help from God continually. To, to challenge us about slipping back into the old ways and the old habits. Jesus is alive. And he's come to recall them to their initial work. And to recommission them for the gospel. In verses 5 through 8 we find these words written. Then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. 
Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with a fish. And then if you run your eye down to verse 11, Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. You've probably not read Luke chapter 5 for a long time, but the parallels here are astounding. The parallels here are astounding. This, in fact, is the Lord of glory taking them back three years and saying to them, listen guys, I called you to follow me. And that's exactly what should be happening. In this calling, as I'll seek to show you, he demonstrates his omniscience. He knows exactly what's going on. (coughs) He also shows his compassion. Because this is the Savior who loved us and gave himself for us. He looks upon us with grace and favor so that we might be delivered from sin and judgment. And he is our savior, our great high priest who ever lives to make intercession for us. He's not going to come down on us with a hammer to crush us. It's not his purpose to grind us into the dust. It's his purpose to help us to be who he's called us to be and who he is equipping us to be. And so by confirming their previous calling, he's saying to them, come on guys, it's time you were back where you should be. It's time where you were looking ahead as I once equipped you to look ahead and then to live that way. So though their steps are faltering, his love is steadfast. His covenant that he's made and cut on the cross at Calvary is now established Sinners who know God, who come into a relationship with him, are permanently in that relationship with all of their shortcomings. Hallelujah. What a saviour. Jeremiah reflected on that back in Lamentations 3.22, when he says, Though the Lord's mercies, sorry, through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed. He looks on us. He remembers that we are dust. He understands without excusing the the, the foibles, the foolishness of our lives. And each time he comes back to us and he says, let's get back on course. Look back at verse 5. Children, have you any food? In the Greek, there's an ability to actually tell you that the answer to this question was anticipated when it was asked. They include a little word, you can study it someday if you feel inclined, which tells you the answer to this question is no. And that he knew that it was no. And it's from this that we see his omniscience. He knows everything that's going on. He knows exactly where his disciples are. He knows exactly what's troubling them. He knows exactly how they need to be helped. Children, have you any food? And of course, they answer him, no. He's brought them to this point. He brings them into this place where they will recognize their need of him and will depend upon him. The word children is interesting here. Even as we sang that hymn uh, earlier on, you know, praise him, praise him, all you little children. We tend to think of tiny tots, don't we? But in actual fact, we are all children of God by God's grace. This word children is unusual because it means kids. A good old Scots word, bairns. Little ones. Or if, if, if a group were together, they would say, come on, boys. There's a light here which shows, even in asking the question, that he has love and affection for them. Back in chapter 13, verse 33, he had said, little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, as I said to the Jews, where are you going? You, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say, to you. One of my commentaries writes, backsliders? No. Rebels? No. Ex-apostles? Former disciples? No. 
Jesus calls these disobedient disciples his kids. And so right here at this point, even before he begins to say anything else to them, in asking the question, he's giving evidence of his love for them. And then evidence of his power, evidence of his omniscience, his total control of what happens. Cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast now and were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Back in Luke chapter 5, we are told there were so many fish that the net was breaking. This net is not breaking. This net stays consistent and he pulls in the fish. He's acting in that way as he did back then, showing that he knows better than the expert fishermen exactly where the fish are. And that those who will act in obedience to him will in fact find that he knows exactly where the fish are. One commentator cleverly said, whichever side Jesus tells you to cast on is the right side. They cast on the right side. And you will find some. It says in Luke chapter 5, the effect of what happened back then in verse 11, it says, So when they brought their boats to the land, they forsook all and followed him. They had this fantastic catch back then and they said, doesn't matter. What matters is I've come to know, to love and to follow the Saviour. Can you imagine yourself in the boat? Can you imagine yourself thinking like a disciple who remembered what had happened back then and was watching it happening all over again? It's an amazing text to let your mind run around in. Peter himself is dramatically affected by this, isn't he? Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved, that's always the Apostle John, said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it and plunged into the sea. There's significant matter just in that verse. It is the Lord. Here he is, broad daylight. This is no trick of the imagination. This really is Jesus. He really is alive. In the beginning of the Acts of the Apostles, it tells us that the the Saviour appeared to the disciples over a period of 40 days. This is one of them. Where they knew for certainty that Jesus was physically alive in broad daylight. And Peter, it, it changes his life. When they fished in those days, they stripped down to their undergarments. And we'd probably have come ashore in their undergarments. But you see, it is the Lord. There's a respect there. He wants to cover up. And contrary to reason, he covers up and jumps into the sea and starts swimming. Can you imagine how hard that was? But there he is. He recognises Jesus. He recognises, this is where my life is to focus. This is what my life is about. He is the one whom I want to be with. Whatever it costs. And of course it comes out in Peter's two epistles, chapter 1 verse 3 of 1 Peter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope. Can you finish it? I've used it often over these last weeks. He's begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Of Jesus Christ from the dead. Is that hope alive in you? Is that hope functioning in your life? As it could. A few weeks ago somebody who was listening to these sermons from the recordings. I went to visit them. And he was greatly troubled. He says you talk about this living hope. I don't know anything about it being alive in me. And maybe it's time we all began to be honest before God and say you know my Christianity well I know the theory but where's the person where's the power and I do believe that's the difference between the kind of Christianity we have at present and revival you see revival is not some magic fairy dust from in heaven it's a realization by the people of God that Jesus is alive 
And that's the news that turned the first century world upside down and the news that will turn our 21st century upside down. 2 Peter 1.16 For we did not follow cunningly devised fables. I hope that's underlined in your Bible. This is not a fairy story, says Peter. We did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We saw this for ourselves and you need to understand it. And so these disciples are now in the presence of the living Lord Jesus. And I, I want to suggest to you that even as he called those men to himself, he calls you and me to himself day after day. Sunday is a special occasion for the church to come together. We open the word of God together, not only to learn what it says, not to pick up simply some rules and regulations for our life, but to be challenged about the reality of a living relationship with a living Savior. That country western song just popped into my mind. For he walks with me and he talks with me. And he tells me, I am his own. Oh dear friend, how I long for more of that in my life. And I pray that that's your longing too. Because that's what will make us distinct in our generation. So much of our world, they're longing for something else. And if you fill the vessel with junk, it will just sink. Are you longing for more of the Saviour, to know his presence and his power? Oh, dear friends, how our eyes need to be open to this great truth, to understand that, that just by admitting it, he's not going to come down hard and heavy on you. He's going to put his arms around you and say, wow, it's about time. How I want you to do this, how I need you to do this. This was again the thing that made the gospel message the catalyst which transformed the first century world and which has transformed the world ever since. Remember Tyndale's prayer? He wanted the ploughboy at the plough to have the word of God in his own language. Not just for his education, but for his, for his transformation. You've got it in your own language, in multiple devices, and that's why we carry it to church. That's why we read it together. We need this kind of food. This is the bread my body needs to live and to survive on. Jesus is alive. It's a source of great joy and encouragement for everybody who's a believer. But let me remind you, it's a source of terror to anybody who's not. And if non-Christians are not terrorized by the reality of the resurrection, there's something wrong with them. Oh yes, that's what the Bible says. They're dead in trespasses and sins. They're, they're deluded by this world and the, the things of this world. I read last week of a, a missionary who was in the South Sea Islands and he was preaching on the resurrection and the chief of the tribe turned to him and said, Sir, I love you much, but the words of resurrection are too great for me. I do not wish to hear about the dead rising again. The dead cannot rise. The dead shall not rise. Tell me, my friend, why not? He was asked. Because I have slain my thousands. Do you think I want them to rise again? <clears throat> you see, the reality is, hell will not only be made up of your separation from God, but will be made up of your companionship with all those people that you, you've avoided for, for generations. You've not been here for centuries. Hell will be a hellish place from many ang angles. And therefore the resurrection is a challenge to you to come to Christ. To flee now, to realize there's full forgiveness for people who are less than perfect. Finally, it's breakfast time. This takes us back to another miracle as the Lord of glory demonstrates his power and his, his promise to provide for the needs of his people. 
it should take your mind back to John chapter 6. You remember the story there was about fish and bread also. How can we get food for this great big crowd? Well, there's a lad here with a few sandwiches and some sardines, as one commentator says. And then from those few sandwiches and sardines he fed thousands. Watch the parallels. Verse 9. Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread, sardines and sandwiches. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153, and although there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, Come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask them, Who are you, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. This is now the third time. Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Even as he fed the crowds back then and declared to them that he is indeed the bread of life and that whoever eats of him will not perish but have everlasting life, he's taking them back to basics. I commissioned you as fishermen and I can make you fishermen. But you're not on your own. You're in a world where I'm providing for you and where you and I have fellowship. Remember, one of the possibilities, one of the reasons they went fishing was because they believed they needed to provide for themselves. Here he is with breakfast on the skillet waiting to feed their souls. It's an amazing account, an amazing testimony where where he is his work will prosper we will be provided for and by eating breakfast with him we'll enjoy a fellowship with him they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread notice it's not part of the catch that they've made this food is already cooking before they come to shore This is a picture, you see, of his provision for them. This is a picture of the way that God is able to provide for his people, will and does provide for his people, in spite of all their worries and their challenges. Some even want us to think that maybe this miracle took place just about where the previous feeding of the 5,000 took place. I've never been to Galilee, but surely if we ever managed to get there, you would want to go to some of those locations and just allow your mind to to, to flood with the information that you have. Here the Lord of glory, who had multiplied loaves and fishes to feed many, has enough to feed these people themselves. And then the the, the way that he then asks them to bring in the fish which they have caught is thought to be symbolizing the fact that they are to be involved in, in seeing the church grow and develop and providing for the work of the gospel down through the ages. They're part of what he is doing in the world. One writer says the invitation of Jesus to eat was a call to the resumption of that fellowship which his death had broken. If they had previously doubted their own senses or his identity on occasions when he appeared to them as a group, they could do so no longer. Doubtless they had eaten in this fashion many times beside the lake. You see, they needed convincing. Here's the convincing. There's food here. Bring what you've got and add it to it and we'll have a a, a time of fellowship together. One of the intriguing things about this passage is 153. You'd be amazed how many books have been written about the meaning of 153. And do you know what the meaning is? There was 153 fish caught. That's as far as it goes. Everything else is conjecture. It's a large catch of big fish 
picturing some of the big fish that would be caught as we read the Acts of the Apostles. Scribes and Sadducees, chapter 2. Cornelius, chapter 10. A picture of the way the gospel would go on. I've missed out the real big fish, the Apostle Paul. But the gospel would make progress through their hands by the work that God had given them to do and that they would develop it fully. Come and eat breakfast. Fascinating thought. I assume you all have this morning. Some people are foolish enough not to, so they say. But as they say, it's, it's the most important meal of the day, isn't it? There's no more important thing to do every day than to meet with Jesus. It might not be at breakfast time. I don't think we can be adamant about the time of day when it happens. But there, there has to be that time of day when we meet with Jesus and have fellowship with him. You see, a, a meal in Palestine in those days was not simply stuffing your face so you could get on and do the next thing. It was a, it was a relaxed time. It was a time of talking. It was a time of fellowship. And so a call to a meal was a call to enter in once again to fellowship with the Lord of glory himself. There's a verse in Revelation chapter 3 which is often misused as a gospel invitation. If you look at the context, it's actually talking to the church. And it's indicating that at the church in Laodicea, somehow the Lord Jesus had got locked out. And in Revelation 3.20 it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him. And he with me. There's the same symbolism. What he's saying is, when the church gets to the point where it's so lethargic that it's no longer really conscious of the Lord's presence, all it takes is for one individual to realize that the Lord calls us to dine with him and to make that their business... And then the church can be recovered and restored. Oh, that all who hear this would make it their business to be in the presence of the Lord daily, regularly, feeding their souls, seeking his face, so that whatever else has to be done in the day, this is my priority. We get other things, don't we, into our lives? When the kids are young, you're in a spin just trying to keep up with them. And when you become granddads and grandmas, you can get back into that spin and it's really hectic. My morning order has just been turned upside down in the last four or five months, as, as long as that. Maybe even longer now. We get the grandchildren for breakfast. No, we don't eat them. They come into the house. <laughs> and so about eight o'clock and a quarter to eight in the morning, the whole world changes for 45 minutes. Oh, my nice routine and practice and habit has a big, big hole in the middle now. But you do need to realize that while there are great joys in these things, there's something, someone who is more important, and that's the Lord himself. Time spent with him is essential to a living experience. It's not enough to say, yes, I know he's alive. I believe he came back from the dead. You have to be able to, to, to know in your own mind you've been listening to him. How do you listen to Jesus? Read the book. Every word and every page is God-breathed. How do you form words? By using your breath to make words. Every word in this book comes from God himself. So you can honestly say, I heard God speak today. And in, in a proper discussion, you talk back, don't you? Not in the impudent sense, but you, you, you relate back again. What does the Bible call that? That's prayer, isn't it? It's taking God's words, said Mr. Spurgeon, and inverting them. Lord, you, you called these disciples to enjoy breakfast with you. Lord, I would love to have breakfast with you. I would love you to be here at this my breakfast time. And to know before I go out into the challenge of the day that you and I are right. And that we're equipped to live for his glory. What a thing it is 
to enjoy such a breakfast time. And what a thing it is for us as Christians to tell the non-believer this is the real Christianity. This is what we want you to have. This is what we are saying you need to come to enjoy. And it all begins by saying to Jesus, I'm a sinner, you're the saviour. Save me. And then a relationship begins which lasts forever. Christian, dear brother and sister, you and I need again to know this call on our lives. Christ arose from the dead. He is alive. And he should be living. Now I'm going to turn it around. And we should be living in his presence day after day, week after week, month after month. You can't cope otherwise. You'll fail. That's what the passage says. With Christ all things are possible. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Have you seen those big American cars where they don't have individual seats at the front of a long bench? A married couple were driving in the car after many years of marriage. She was at one end and he was at the other. And so she says to him, why can't we sit close together like we did shortly after our marriage? Her husband answered, I haven't moved. What happens is we just move out, don't we? And, and, and my heart's desire, my cry, my, my own exhortation to my soul is get back close to Jesus. Because he's alive, they saw him in broad daylight. Amen.